Shalom. Good morning. Welcome to church. Glad to see you all uh, make a time to come today to the house of God to praise, to worship, and to listen to His word today. Word for our body, our life for the coming week. Welcome, everybody. So, opening reading from Psalm 96 from ICB Bible. Praise for God's glory. Or sing to the Lord a new song. Sings to the Lord all the earth. This new song is not mean a new song, new lyric, or new melody, but all hymn sing with a fresh from our heart. The new day today. Amen. All the church, all his creation, sings to the Lord and prays his name. Every day tell how he saved us. Hallelujah. I like it. I love this verse. Every day tell how he saved us. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. There is New King James. Tell all the people the miracle he does. Hallelujah. That is good. When you talk to your friend, when you talk about Jesus, there is nothing else for you to talk about except his goodness, except his mercy, his grace, his healing, his protection. Nothing bad to talk about him. Nothing to gossip about him. <laughs> Amen? There's nothing negative about him. He's good. Amen? Test. And he is good in your own life. The Lord is great. He should be praised. Amen? So let us all stand and join the worship team. Sing unto the Lord new songs. Song of praise and thanksgiving and proclaim to all the earth his wonderful salvation let us tell everybody the wonder of his name because the name of Jesus is greatly to be praised amen for all he has done he is good Jesus love you all sing to him praise him amen praise Hallelujah. before we start can we turn around to our neighbors and say Jesus loves you. Because some of us really need to hear that. All of us, I think, need to hear that. We need to be reminded, right? Jesus loves you. And you, and you, and every one of us here. Amen. Yes. Yes, Jesus loves you so much. Hallelujah. Are we ready? Okay. Amen. Thank you.
our bondage, Lord. shackles of you, God, so we can dance, Lord, so we can praise, oh God. You give us, oh Father, a garment of praise for our heaviness, oh Lord, and in us, oh Father God, there is fountain, endless well of praise to you, oh God.
how good you are to us, O Father.
God is good, right? Full stop. His love, His mercy, His grace, His protection, His healing will hunt you down and overtake you. Amen? The evidence is all around. Amen? Amen. Thank you. God is good. No more word. Mention. Because He is good. Thank you. You may be seated. We invite all believers to join us for the Holy Communion. Um, today we come to the Lord's table to have communion with Him. To listen to what He had to say to us today. The communion verse is taken from Isaiah 41 verse 10. We're so familiar with, with this. Fear not, says the Lord, for I am with you. The day I meditate on this simple verse, just one line, fear not, I am with you. If you close your eyes, know that he is with you and he said to you fear not for I am with you I mean God reminding us not to fear because his presence is ever with us the Emmanuel there are so many things in this world to fear because we are vulnerable to troubles but as children of God we need not fear Amen. for God is with us God wants us to have faith in Him, no matter what happened to us. Rather than magnifying the problem or the, or the situation we are passing through. Whatsoever we go through in life, church, we can always depend on God's promises for us. He has never failed us. He never failed. So don't lose hope. For every challenge has an expiry date. Your challenge has expired dead. Your sickness has expired dead. Your cancer has expired dead. Name the dead. Name the dead. They expired. Iban madah dah expired. Ngarai tau kenal lagi. Ngarai tau ngacau lagi. Udah expired. Dah mati. Be not dismay. Be not afraid. For I am your God. Hallelujah. Just that word. Do not be afraid. I am your God. Amen? God wants us to remain calm in distress or in presence of your enemies or whatever problem you have. We read in the book of Psalm that God, who is our ever presence, help in time of trouble, is always with us. Amen? Being this man, mean unbelief. Right? God is always there when we face with difficulties, even in death. The song we sing just now, just look to the empty grave, because His abiding presence is ever with you, ever with us. What a faithful God we serve. Amen. Why? Do not fear, do not be afraid. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. Kalau kamu sudah sakit, if you are sick, your immune system going down, God said, I will strengthen you. If you're so weak in life, being bullied, people talk bad about you, people gossip about you, people betray you, people taking advantage of you because of your weakness. Today, God said, I will strengthen you. I will give you strength. You don't have to bully back. Your God will fight it for you. He will lift you up. Those who bully you, there, six feet under the ground, in Jesus' name. Amen? He will strengthen you. He will help you 365 days per year. 
every day. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Hallelujah. Jesus engkau wak kita. Engkau wak kita. Engkau wak. Ketika English ni pun engkau wak. Put his arm around, around your shoulder. He will say, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Don't worry, son. Don't worry. I'm with you. I love you. Don't worry. I'm with you. This communion, this breakfast, this morning, God said, I'm with you. Whatever happened to you, I'm with you. I'm your God. I'm not good if I'm not your God. So make Jesus God. You know, make Jesus God. Make him God in your life. Make him Lord. Walk on water with him. Amen. And I like what James Tan's post this week. We are so focused on the cross. We are so focused on the on the finished work. But we forget we are in the throne of grace. Seated at Father's right hand in Christ. That is where we are. Not only at the cross. Not only the resurrection, but we are seated in Christ in heaven. So in this communion, Jesus said, on the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. Church, on the night that you know that you will be betrayed, take bread. On the night that you know that you are sick, take bread. On the night that you know that you have problem, take bread. Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. He said, this is my body which is broken for you so that your body will be whole. Let us partake. He also took the cup after supper saying, this is my blood for the forgiveness of your sin. In the gospel, before Jesus healing, before he blessed anybody, he said, your sin has been forgiven. Receive what God has for you. Today, your sins has been forgiven. Receive your blessing. Receive your healing. Receive your protection. Receive your breakthrough. Let's drink. Hallelujah. God is good. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. I just feel like I want to say thank you to our Lord Jesus who healed us this morning. In my morning prayer, around nine something this morning, <laughs> I rehearsed what I'm going to do during this Holy Communion. I said, God heal those who are here at the upper room. God heal those who are at home. God heal those who are in the hospital. And after that, a few minutes later, Felicia was at Duke's discharge today. Hallelujah. God is good. And whatever situation you have, whatever sickness you have, sister, God heal you today. Receive your healing. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. For Thai and offering. From Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Bring to the storehouse a ten of what you gain. Then there will be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord of heaven. Amen. I will open the windows of heaven for you. Hallelujah. That's his promise. He will open the windows of heaven for you. For what? To look at your sin? No. He said, I will pour out more blessings than you have room for it. And I am man. <laughs> God said, I will pour out more blessings than you have room for it. Are your house big enough for it? Are your heart big enough for it? Are your faith big enough to receive? Amen? I will stop the insect so they won't eat your crops. The grapes won't fall from your vine before they are ready to pick, says the Lord of heaven. And that means all the nations will call you blessed. Everybody will call you blessed. The Iban call you blessed. The Chinese call you blessed. The Malay call you blessed. Amen? The Eurasian call you blessed. Why? Because you are blessed. Amen? You will have 
a pleasant country, says the Lord of heaven and earth. Selamat gawai. Tambah ke lagi. Selamat gawai ke guru, gerai nyamai. Boleh duit, boleh ringgit, boleh rita, boleh tingkira, boleh pengayau, boleh pengeraja, boleh nama tempat rita. Amin. Gayu guru magang-magang. Semua kita. In Jesus name. Amin. Okay. Show notice. In July, Reverend John Brito will be here to share a word of God and the spirit with us about salvation, healing, prophecy, deliverance, and revival. From 8th July, 9th July, and 10th July, all meeting will be here at Upper Room. So we need workers, volunteers, intercessors. So if you are available, you register to the help desk to serve the Lord in His house. Amen. God bless you. So let's call Edna Tom to share with us. Thank you so much, Brother Edward. Good morning, PM Grace. Nice to see all of you here. The fact that I'm here with this message, which is part four of Song of Solomon, in itself is a miracle because I never thought I would do a series. In fact, I never thought I would do any message from the Song of Solomon in a serious manner. So when the Lord led me to it, I thought uh, this probably is a mistake. <laughs> but I gave it a try and I just find that uh, he has much to say. So let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for everyone present. And those who are not able to be present, thank you for the good news that Dukis is discharged from hospital. We pray that all the infections that affected her body have now been neutralized and everything in her body is restored and renewed and refreshed back to the way you created her to be. Totally perfect in Jesus' name. Amen. And... Um, one of the things about Song of Solomon is, is um, as I approach it, you find different layers. It is on its own a love story, a love letter. Two people, a man or a woman, romantically attracted to one another, looking forward to marriage. So that's one level. It's, it's a cultural setting of about 3,000 years ago. So the language and the way they see things and express things will be very, very different from the way we do things today. So if you're courting, I would advise you don't repeat the same language necessarily uh, because you may not get the, <laughs> the response that you want. If you call your girlfriend that your waist is like a sack of wheat, uh, I'm not sure, you know, or your teeth is like the sheep coming out of the waters. But anyhow, uh, some parts are perhaps suggestive or provocative and sexually. Now, God is a holy God. He allowed this letter to be written to express pure love. The attraction, the physical attraction between a man and a woman is a natural, biblical, holy thing that God created and he placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Amen. Of course, the devil wants to corrupt and, and, and destroy everything that is good in God's eyes. And so the devil takes innocent love and the sex for marriage and so on and so forth and totally corrupts it and, and makes it a dirty thing. So I think it is good for us parents, young adults, parents with teens and so on and so forth, that maybe there's a reason why we're going through this book um, seeing that in the spirit we are not in lust because of sin, we're in love because of Christ. Amen. So, um, the way we interpret, the way I'm leading us in this is that we interpret it, first layer, in its literal sense, the way it's written, the way the author of 3,000 years ago communicated. In other words, we are not interpreting it in a totally uh, uh, metaphorical, uh, sorry, allegorical sense, trying to put secret meanings into every word. You just take it in a literal sense, but we also read it with New Testament truth. And I introduce this idea of word association. If you read the word, 
what does it trigger in terms of memory from the New Testament and in the understanding of Christ's love for us. Okay, and the other reason why we, we, we look at this book is because all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Therefore, all of us who are believers, we need to know how to handle the Song of Solomon, <laughs> basically. Uh, amen. Hallelujah. So this portion of part four, I've taken the title from chapter four, verse seven. And it says this in the title, You are all fair, my love, and without spot. This is the beloved addressing the Shulamite. You are all fair, my love, and without spot is the title. Let me read to you Solomon 4, verses 7 to 8. You are all fair, my love, and there is no spot in you. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse. With me from Lebanon, look from the top of Amana, from the top of Sinair and Hermon, from the lion's dens, from the mountains of the leopards. Come with me. Later on, we'll get to chapter 4 and look at the bigger context. But I'm taking, I deliberately pick a title from the chapter that we, we will visit. And then that helps us to put a bit of a focus. Now, when you read the Song of Solomon, you will find that five, all the five senses are aroused. In other words, the, the eyes to see, the nose to smell, hearing in the ears, touching with the hands, the taste, the mouth, all of this are involved. This is not to sensualize anything. This is not to stir up lust, like we say, because these are created uh, things it, that God has given us. Jesus ate and drank with sinners. He must taste. In the wedding in Cana, when they ran out of wine, he made the best wine. And everybody appreciated it. They know what the taste is like. He fed 5,000. He also fed 4,000. He understands that. So he, he, um, and also he has ears to hear people calling out to him, Son of David, help me. He sees his ears to hear. At the cross, he was given sour wine. There was scented oil anointing his feet by the woman who came. And he touched and healed the leper. He saw with his eyes Mary Magdalene and called her. And although in Song of Solomon we talk about kissing, that your love is better than wine, Jesus himself was betrayed by a kiss. He suffered, he felt pain. He suffered before and at the cross. So Jesus has all of these uh, attributes about being a physical person. So that in itself is not an unholy thing. That is a created thing. There's a God-endowed thing. Amen. And so to appreciate one another, especially in the context of romance and marriage, these faculties are there for, from God to bless us. Amen. Now, I cannot help when we apply the word association thing that I introduced uh, a week or two ago. You are all fair, my love, and there is no spot in you. What does that remind you of? Ephesians chapter 5, I guess. The church, the washing of the word without spot or wrinkle. Amen? Oh yeah, by the way, I must uh, uh, say this. We're talking about romance and marriage and so on and so forth. We must offer our congratulations to Vandolph and Tracy, our drummer, who just got married on Tuesday. <laughs> and thank you also for, to Marina Pudun for initiating from her hospital bed uh, to have a Mother's Day celebration which they had last night. So thank you, Marina, for the initiative. <laughs> so I think this whole idea of the <laughs> Song of Solomon is really God-inspired, right? I'm the fourth installment and we have weddings and we have Mother's Day and so on. Praise God. So... 
you are all fair, my love, and there's no spot in you, reminds me of Ephesians chapter 5. So let me read this context because it has to do with husband and wife. This is not a marriage seminar by any means. Um, in Ephesians chapter 5, it's preceded by walk in love, walk in the light, and walk in truth. This is what the Apostle Paul was emphasizing. And it's like a funnel, this funnel of walking in love, in truth, and in light funnels down to the husband and wife. So this, this passage I'm going to read to you, this portion, is not in isolation. It's about the New Testament life, what Christ has made possible. Right? Gentiles don't understand this, but so God, the Apostle Paul likes to explain it. So it's funneling down of truth, life, Sorry, it's truth, light, and, and, and wisdom. Hallelujah. Verse 22. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the, of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their, their own husbands in everything. Just pause there for a moment. The church is subject to Christ. Hallelujah. So we must feel very secure. Amen. This is not about uh, uh, submission and obeying orders, you know, as if somebody's got a big cane. It is out of a love relationship. We are subject to Christ. And so we must be very secure in that love environment that Christ has in relation to his church. B.M. Gray says, this is the church that Jesus loves. So let us personalize it that this is the church that Jesus loves. It is good to say that our oh, God is love and therefore he sent his son to save the world and not to punish. Well, that's very good. But God loves me. God loves you. Jesus loves you enough to go to the cross. We must receive that. The bigger picture is this. God is holy. Amen. Amen. He is absolutely holy. And in His absolute holiness, there is no sin, nor any tolerance of sin. So sin must be punished and dealt with. And so when the devil introduced sin into his creation, he was determined to deal with it, and deal with it most thoroughly by sending his son, because he loved us. But before that, is, He is a holy God. His love for us saved us to bring us into His presence, which is absolutely holy. So in Ephesians chapter 1, we read of God having blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. And Jesus' mission was to present all of us that He has saved and present us to Father blameless, in love, perfect, and holy. That is his mission. Amen. So by his spirit, he draws us, he woos us with his love, bring us from darkness to light, bring us from sin into holiness. Amen. Sin was destroyed by him. Death was destroyed by him. The enemy, the devil, will we already know one day we'll be locked up in the lake of fire, once and for all, forever. Amen. And so we would have God to ourselves, and God will have us to himself. Amen. This is the love relationship that he has for us. So in the Song of Solomon, it is expressed in one layer between a man and a woman, but also in another layer between Christ and the church. Amen. And so... When we read about no spot, we go to chapter 5 of Ephesians. This is what we read. Now, addressing the husbands. And by the way, when God says to the wives, submit to the husbands, it just means preparing the hearts of the wives because he has something to say to the husbands. <laughs> right? So women, please don't take this as some kind of indictment just pointing a finger at the wives. No, he's saying the wives, you do this because I have a word for the husbands. So, okay, men. This is our turn. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, 
that you might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of, of water by the word, that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. So husbands, we have a duty to bless and to speak in our relationship with our wife. Amen. The security, the love, the blessing comes from us. As Christ loves the church, He washes the body with His Word. Amen. So men, <laughs> if you're not yet signed up for Rima, you must sign up. Because you must lead your house with an understanding of the Word. Otherwise, it will be difficult for you to release the Word to wash. Not that your wife is dirty or anything, but to wash us to remind us, to bless us with His Word, with His presence, with His goodness, amen, with His hope, with His healing, with His restoration. Hallelujah. For years now, like, like Tracy and Vandal, in the first week of marriage, and in the 10th year of marriage, and the 20th year, and the 30th year, and the 40th year of marriage, and so on. Amen. Hallelujah. We, we are leaders in this way. And then, Husband, love your wife as you love yourself. This is important. If you don't know how to love yourself, you have some problems. Loving yourself is not loving yourself in a selfish way, and the way to love yourself is the first to release the love of Father God towards you. It's not just God loves the world, as I explained just now, and you become a mighty evangelist. That is wonderful. But first and foremost, God loves me. And that must overflow. And in that love that we have from Him gives us the security, amen, to face challenges and uncertainties. Amen. Hallelujah. For this, man, a man, for this reason, a man shall leave his father, his mother, and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So God has ordained it such Physically, biologically, the security and the union is sealed in this fashion. Hallelujah. This is a great mystery, but I'm speaking concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and the wife, let the wife see that she respects her husband. I think women, you know the secret, right? Your husband cannot do without respect. He will fall apart. If there is an Achilles heel in men, is they need respect. Whether they know it or not, but <laughs> that's the real deal. Amen? And you're not going to get the respect if you don't love properly. So men, these are lessons, lessons for us. Hallelujah. Love as you love yourself, as Christ loves the church. Amen. And as you love yourself, present yourself well as well. This is not a selfish love. Present yourself so that your wife can appreciate you. And wives, present yourself in the nicest way that your husbands can appreciate you. Amen. It means good, good grooming. Hallelujah. Anyhow, I tell you what, this is not just my words. As we look into the Song of Solomon, ah, you find there's plenty of it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Of course, don't forget birthdays and anniversaries and connect with our church family. We should not be in isolation. As Christ loves the church, there's this family, husband and wife love, which is mirrored in Christ loving the church. So if we are a gospel-following Christian family, if we are dissociated or disconnected from church, it, it, it doesn't make sense. It has to be well, well connected. Amen. So that we also have, be a disciple of Christ, have the word of God to speak it. Amen. 
And I think last week I managed to get halfway to chapter 2 of the Song of Solomon. And I think I talked about the rapture and so on, things like that. Uh, now I'm starting with verse 14 of Song of Solomon, chapter 2, all right? Because last week we already dealt with earlier passage. It reads like this. Again, we're trying to use word association so that what we can recall another passage from God to help us connect so that this love letter, because I'm now on a, on a, on a pulpit on a Sunday, I'm not reading to my, my wife, and my wife is not reading to me. I'm addressing the church, all right? So then we read this as a love letter from, from Christ to us. That will be one way. And he wants to remind us of his story from the beginning to the end. Verse 14, Oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the cliff, let me see your face, let me hear your voice. For your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. So obviously, the beloved is addressing the Shulamite, desiring to see her and to hear her. But in poetry, the language gets a bit flowery, right? But it triggers a few things, right? The dove. Noah's flood, the dove compared with the, uh, um, the crow, is it the crow? Anyhow, the, the dove is the, the innocent, uh, beautiful uh, a bird, just like when Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit descended looking like a dove. So we get the idea uh, of dove representing something pretty and pure. So the, the man sees the woman in that manner. In the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the cliff, what does that remind you of? Moses desiring to see the face of God, remember? And God says, you can't see me because I'm holy. If you see me, you die. But here is in the cleft of the rock. Here's a little space here. I will put you there and you see me pass by. You just see my rear. You won't see my front. But I will reveal to you what I'm like. Even though you don't see me, I will reveal to you what I'm like. I will make all of my goodness pass before you. We just sang the song. It's his goodness which is his grace and his compassion. Amen. So, this love letter written by King Solomon, right, expressing love between the beloved and the Shulamite, carries these words. And don't forget, Solomon also knows his Torah. He is after Moses, all right? So, he's familiar with this kind of imageries also, so he draws it in. In verse 15 here, the brothers of the Shulamite interjects, catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. <laughs> like, hang on, where on earth did this thing come from? Where is this interjection from? <clears throat> I think from the introduction, <clears throat> I think I've already explained that the brothers of the Shulamite bully her and expect her to look after their vineyards besides hers. So they just want her to work, 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 and meanwhile, they go and kaki. All right? So... What the brothers are saying, look, stop this romantic nonsense. This, this shepherd boy that's drawing attention, your time, and so on and so forth, is like a fox. Get rid of it. But the Shulamite, in protest, says, My beloved is mine, and I am his. He feeds his flock among the lilies. In other words, I know my lover. He is mine and I am his. I know my Christ. I am his and he is mine. He is mine and I am his. Amen. We have to come to this confidence to know who we are in Christ. Hallelujah. The brothers are there to disrupt the romance and say, get back to work. And she says, no. He is mine and I am his. This is the earlier part Chapter 2, she says it in this way that my beloved is mine and I'm, I possess him. But in chapter 6, as, the, as we develop further, she changes position that I am his and he is mine. It's not so much who we possess, but rather who has possessed us. Amen. But in this instance, she is putting in her defense from her perspective. And in, in God's perspective, she yields and surrenders 
that she actually belongs to God. Hallelujah. And then, uh, by the way, she also is saying, my beloved is not a fox. My beloved is not a wild animal that destroys vineyards. He feeds his flock among the lilies. He is in nature. He has a flock. Foxes attack flocks. He's not a fox. He's a shepherd. He, so he, she doesn't accept that association. In fact, Jesus labeled Herod as a fox. <laughs> Remember? Tell that fox. <laughs> now, wives, sometimes we may have to come to the defense of our husbands. People say bad things and so on and so forth. But you must know your husbands very well. I mean, you cannot put up a defense if you are ignorant. So the transparency, the good language between husband and wife is, is, is very important. Amen. Moving on. She says to her beloved, Until the day breaks and the shadows flee away, turn, my beloved, to be and be like a gazelle or a young stag upon the mountains of Bither. Not so easy, but I think when the day breaks, we have to separate and you, you go quickly because my brothers, they are not happy for you. They, they are not happy that we are seeing one another. When the day breaks, go quickly. The word bither or better is a word that means separation. Amen? Okay, let's, let's move on to chapter 3. In chapter 3, uh, by the way, Song of Solomon is not a linear story, right? These are scenes. Uh, of, of people in love and the reality of that relationship is not always rosy and hunky-dory and sometimes uh, things happen, unexpected things happen and, and then the emotions are involved. I mean, so you, 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 you feel it and you express yourself. And in chapter 3, she's lovesick. Something has happened, she's lovesick and she has a bad dream. Right? The Shulamite. By night on my bed, I sought the one I love. I sought him, but I did not find him. So obviously, something is broken, an expectation of certain things, but somehow he is missing. I will rise now, I said, and go about the city. In the streets and in the squares, I will seek the one whom I love. I sought him, but I did not find him. I just want to pause here for a while. To seek someone so intensely, the Bible encourages us to seek the someone. Can you remember that? You read Proverbs? <laughs> remember Solomon, who wrote Ecclesiastes? He also wrote Proverbs. Proverbs 1, remember the book of wisdom. In verse 7 it says, The fear of the Lord is beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Verse 10, My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. And verse 20, this is it. Wisdom calls aloud outside. She raises her voice in the open squares. So she's looking for him in desperation. And sometimes we get into a spot whereby we really need wisdom. Right? We need the spirit of wisdom to come upon us and we are reminded of Proverbs 1 to go and look for the wisdom. But actually wisdom is calling. And those who will hear the call will come to wisdom. It's only the fools that despise knowledge. Amen. We're moving on. Verse 3. The watchmen who go about the city found me. I said, have you seen the one I love? Scarcely had I passed by them when I, pa passed by them when I found the one I love. I held him and would not let him go until I brought him to the house of my mother and into the chamber of her who conceived me. So she, she finds him, right? And you can imagine this, this is a dream. It's not a physical thing. And so she brings him to the security of her mother's room. She's obviously secure in that room. And so in her comfort, she brings him into that room. And I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles and by the doors of the field, do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. This, this verse is also difficult to see exactly what it means. Let me just read for you. 
in a, this is also ex, uh, in an earlier chapter. As in this previous usage, this idea can be understood as a plea to leave a sweet romantic dream uninterrupted. But in this case, it's not quite a sweet inter uh, romantic dream because things are not going on well. Or it can be understood both in a context of relationship or in passion. We all adults here, right? In terms of relationship, it means leave our love progress and grow until it is matured and fruitful, making a genuinely pleasing relationship. Don't let us go too fast. As one, I've expressed this before. In terms of passion, it means let our love making continue without interruption, interruption until we are both fulfilled. But don't let us start until we can go all the way. Amen? Again, this is, this is a love story. It has with it love constraint within what is permissible by God's uh, created order. Hallelujah. Let's continue. Chapter 3, verse 6. Suddenly the scene changes. Now, in the earlier time when I introduced this, the Shulamite is a, a, a farmhand. People are involved. She's involved in the agriculture industry in the northern part of Israel. She finds this shepherd boy and is drawn to him. Likewise, he is also drawn to her. But lo and behold, this shepherd boy turns out to be the king. It sounds like a Cinderella story, right? <laughs> Anyhow, so here we are. The Shulamite says, Who is this coming out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with mirth and frankincense, with all the merchant's fragrant powders? Behold, it is Solomon's couch, with 60 valiant men around it, of the valiant of Israel. They all hold swords, being expert in war. Every man has his sword on his thigh because of fear in the night. Of the wood of Lebanon, Solomon the king made himself a palanquin. He made it pillars of silver, its support of gold, its seat of purple, its interior paved with love by the daughters of Jerusalem. Go forth, O daughters of Zion, and see King Solomon with the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, the day of the gladness of his heart. Wow. Isn't it fantastic to see somebody coming? You say, hey, who is that horn? And that's about it, right? <laughs> you know, we would just say, who, 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 who's that is coming? You know, every time in the office downstairs, we have this siren, you know. All the VIPs coming to the hotels there, they will run, drive here. And these police outriders will just sound their sirens. And sometimes we wonder who is coming. In fact, most of the time we complain, why so noisy, so loud? You know, just drive, we'll do. <laughs> yeah, but here, it says, who is this who's coming? And you can imagine the poetic language. I mean, how do you... Um, a palanquin is a seat that is carried with, 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 with covers and so on, right? He says it's, it's pillars of silver, support of gold, seat of purple, paved with love. How do you do that? Paved with love by the daughters of Jerusalem. In other words, remember the daughters of Jerusalem? They are like a cheer team. They are like the chorus that comes on. In other words... The daughters of Jerusalem are proofs of this. Their love is on the seat. We, 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 we obviously cannot see it. This is poetic language, right? And, and Solomon has come with the palanquin, with the couch. Remember there was a video, a DVD, I think we showed, I don't know, a year or two, two maybe two years ago, before the wrath. There's a story about the wedding, the Galilean wedding. Do you remember that? It was a story to illustrate the uniqueness of weddings in the time of Jesus in the Galilean era. Right? So he describes the... Um, the okay, let's go to the movie. The movie setting is this. The man and the woman has an interest to be married. Right? So... The, the seniors, the, the, the adults, all the, the penghulus and the datos come together, right? So in the proposal, the man offers the woman a glass of wine. If she accepts the wine, she accepts him to be her husband. If she declines the wine, 
then everything is off. All right? So, reminds us of the communion. We accept her, his wine, a new covenant. We accept his sacrifice on the cross, his love for us. And so we are betrothed then to him for the marriage supper of the Lamb. You follow me so far? So, but in the Galilean setting, this is the, the betrothal. This is the, the arrangement. So let's say the, the woman uh, accepts the wine. She drinks it. Then the negotiation starts, right? Because then the father of the man will have to leave certain deposits, this, this that, that, that. Because now everything is focused to the wedding to come. She will have to have new baju and all that kind of stuff, right? And then he will go back to his father's house and prepare a place. Remember the John 4 part? I go to my father's house. There has many mentions to prepare a place for you. Then I'll come back for you and bring you with me so that where I am, you will be with me also. John chapter 4 is the same kind of idea. Now when he said it, things in that manner, in that setting, the Galileans perfectly understood him. The Asians like us will be a bit blur because we look at it from our wedding point of view and it's difficult to connect. But anyhow, let's say the woman has accepted the glass of wine, right, the cup, sorry. And so there are these negotiations, uh, money is paid, dowry, all that kind of stuff. Then the, the groom and the, and the father and the entourage will go back to whichever village they are from. So now it's a period of preparation and waiting. Nobody knows the day or the time that the groom will return. Only the groom's father sets the day and the time. Isn't it amazing? So, what degree of preparation, how advanced, how many, how big, how great, is for the groom and the father's plan? In fact, the one who is dictating everything is father. Right? He dictates the time. So when the time comes for the groom to return, when they enter the village, they'll sound trumpets. It's not going to be a quiet affair. Right? Because the groom has returned for his bride. And the bride's role over the whole period is just to be ready because he can come at any time. This is the Galilean wedding setting. Amen. So when he does come, his entourage will blow the trumpets. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. With a trumpet and a shout, the dead in Christ will rise up. That is his return for the, 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 the rapture of the church. You see the parallel? And so when he comes, then everything is settled. The, the, the doors are open. They, they enter. And then the, then the doors are closed. And those who fail to enter, you don't enter, you miss the whole deal. Amen. The last part of the bride to be taken to the groom's house is that she gets on a chair that is carried. Similar to what Solomon has written here for us. She is raptured, snatched away. Amen and gone to the groom's house. This is the Galilean wedding picture, and we see it here in this love language. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for your love for us. Amen. And your covenant love for us. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, let's go to chapter 4. There's a little bit of time. Well, if we do chapter 4, we're halfway, you know. This is pretty good. <laughs> in chapter 4, I think it is uh, like, it's not easy to see which, where, where were they married and so on and so forth. That's not the objective of reading the love story, right? For example, you, you are romantically in love, so you write notes to one another, postcards, birthday cards, sometimes silly things, right? you don't put down there when you're going to get married. It's just a lot of love language being passed around, okay? But anyhow, here we have the subtitle in my Bible. It says, The Bridegroom Praises the Bride. So it suggests to us 
that they're, they're getting married. Okay. This is the language of the beloved. Uh, men, you might want to learn a few things from here, but I'll caution you, don't apply directly. You should know your wife better in case she doesn't quite understand what you mean. <laughs> Behold, you are fair, my love. Well, that's easy enough, right? You are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. Remember, the Shulamite was always concerned that she was very dark because the brothers bully her and she works long hours in the sun. And just their culture and our culture also, women sometimes want to be fair, especially when they want to get married. But she, in chapter 1, she's always concerned that she's dark, you know, because of long exposures. But here, look at the beloved. You are fair. Amen. That's music to her ears. <laughs> you are fair, beloved. You have dove's eyes behind your veil. Wow. Jadila in the Your hair is like a flock of goats. Oops. Can work, huh? I'm not sure, you know, because camping is not very common. <laughs> your hair is like a flock of goats going down from Mount Gilead. And we don't know where Mount Gilead is normally, right? Because we're not in Israel. And this is a funny one here, verse 2. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn sheep which have come out from the washing, every one of which bears twins. What does that mean? It means you have nice teeth. You've got teeth on the top and tooth, teeth at the bottom. You don't have anything missing. <laughs> and, none, and none is barren among them. Your lips like a strand of scarlet, and your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like a piece of pomegranate. I really don't know how this one works. I've seen pomegranate. I cannot imagine how. <laughs> but there you are, man. When you're in love, you kind of say silly things, and it's, it still means something good, right? Your neck is like the Tower of David built for an armory. Really? Wow, that's pretty strong. On which hangs a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. Wow. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle, which feed among the lilies. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee away, I will go my way to the mountain of mirth and to the hill of frankincense. You read this appreciation, the groom to the bride. You read this with Jesus in it because there's frankincense and there's mirth and there's a Tower of David. You can see him in the picture as well addressing his lover, his church. And verse 7, this is our title. You're all fair, my love, and there's no spot in you. Jesus sees us all fair without spot. Amen. Because of his blood, Hallelujah. He has cleansed us of all sin, given us a spirit, made us holy, caused us to be adopted to, by, the, by virtue of the Holy Spirit indwelling us and giving us His life. Amen. All of this in, 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 the, in, in the, the process and result of being born again. Hallelujah. So you're all fair, my love, and there's no spot in you. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse. With me from Lebanon, look from the, from the top of Amana, from the top of Sinair and Hermon, from the lion's dens and from the mountains of the leopards. We now know that the beloved is Solomon. His reign, his throne is in Jerusalem. That's a bit further south or in the middle of, of, of Israel. The Shulamite is to the north where Mount Hermon is. So he is saying, come. Remember? He has, in the previous chapter, he has arrived, right? With all the pomp and splendor, with valiant men and so on and so forth, he has arrived. Now he is appreciating his bride. He's saying, come. Come away from that place. Come away from lions and leopards. Come away where there, sometimes there is risky and so on and so forth. My love for you, you're perfect. Come from Lebanon. And verse 9. You have ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. You have ravished my heart with one look of your eyes, with one link of your necklace. How fair is your love, my sister, my spouse? How much better than wine is your love and the scent of your perfumes than all spices? 
he is still pouring out his appreciation to his bride. Hallelujah. Uh, boys, if you are not yet courting, you're thinking of a girlfriend, you might want to learn some love language. Hey, it's natural, okay? Think of it as holiness. Amen? Groom yourself. Have the ability to communicate nice things without being fake. Right or not? And here, in this language of 3,000 years ago, in the, in, the, in, in, in the experience of King Solomon, this is like the highest praise. This is the song of songs. This is the admiration of all admirations. Hallelujah. Your neck, like the Tower of David. If you don't live in that land, you wouldn't have a clue what it's all about. Amen? But he is the king. So to have your neck strong like the Tower of David, and with all the shields of the valiant men put there, that means you are secure. Amen? And you are secure, I will also be secure with you. It has that kind of imagery. Amen? This, this is a king that is talking. Right? He, he can't say, you know, uh, uh, just, just like a shed in the, the, the side of the farm there, like Angkau, you know. He has to speak in terms of castles and bucklers. Amen. Hallelujah. Your lips, O oh my spouse, drip as the honeycomb. Honey and milk are under your tongue, and the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. A garden and clothes is my sister, my spouse. A spring shut up, a fountain sealed. I think this is interesting. Now he's addressing a garden scene and that she is securely kept within it as if she has kept her virginity and she's kept herself her chastity and her purity. Amen. She's like a garden and yet it is enclosed. Your plants are like an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, fragrant henna with spikenard, spikenard and saffron, Calamus and cinnamon and all trees from frankincense, mirth and aloes, and all the cheap spices, a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, and streams of Lebanon. It's many pictures you can see. It's like the Garden of, of Eden with all the best perfumes, the most expensive spices, the most beautiful, the most lush, the best rivers, like words cannot describe. And the Shulamite responds to his praise. Remember, this is like a bridegroom pressing his bride. And the Shulamite responds, Awake, O north wind, and come, O south. Blow upon my garden that, my, that its spices may flow out. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its, its present fruits. This is love talk. He is appreciating him. Sorry. He is appreciating, appreciating her with this wealth of spices and fragrance and so on and so forth. And she is saying, wind, come, blow to my lover. Amen. And let everything that he imagines the beauty of me, let him come to me and I will go to him. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Do we have time? Try a little bit more. <laughs> Solomon chapter 5. Now the bride praises the bridegroom. This, this is now the reverse. In, in chapter 5. But it starts, hang on. It, it, it carries on from 4, then you, 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 you start at 5. The beloved, I've come to my garden, my sister, my spouse. I've gathered my mirth with my spice. I've eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I've drunk my wine with my milk. Eat of friends, drink. Yes, drink deeply of beloved ones. Continuing from where we left, left off, this sounds like a, the, the wedding night, like a wedding party. Amen. Then suddenly comes a change of scene. Something has is, is happened. Um, she's having a nightmare. The Shulamite says, I sleep, but my heart is awake. It's like you're sleeping, but you're having a dream. It is the voice of my beloved. He knocks, saying, Open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. 
for my head is covered with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. I've taken off. But she replies, I've taken off my robe. How can I put it on again? I've washed my feet. How can I defile them? And then she notices this. My beloved put his hand by the latch of the door and my heart yearned for him. I arose to open for my beloved and my hands dripped with mirth and my fingers with liquid mirth on the handles of the lock. I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and was gone. My heart lifted up when she spoke. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him and he gave me no answer. It is like a situation he like as if he is in need of something. She, he needs her presence. He needs to come to her. It's some kind of emergency. And then it didn't happen. She, she was thinking, uh, I, I'm, I'm not ready. I'm not dressed. Uh, I'm in bed. I've washed my feet. And by the time she gets to the door, he's gone. And so she's heartbroken. I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and was gone. My heart leaped up when he spoke. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called, but he gave me no answer. The watchmen who were about the city found me. They struck me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took my veil away from me. Oh, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him I am lovesick. In the dream, she goes looking for him. And of course, you, the security guards down there don't know who you are, right? <laughs> so she gets, she gets badly treated. So it, it, she then tells her mates, this is the, the, the cheer team, if you find my beloved, tell him that I'm lovesick. So I, I needed to go and try and Google and try and explain what does lovesickness mean. Christina and I have been married for over 30 years. I guess we, 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 we don't have love sickness. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, it can happen in a romantic situation. Sometimes perhaps through infatuation, the love is not recipro reciprocated and stuff like that, or things go, go not so well. So what does it mean to feel love sick? This note is take, written by a lady called Amber Trueblood, and she's a licensed marriage and family therapist. This feeling lovesick means you miss or long for a loved one to the point of feeling emotionally or physically ill. Lovesick individuals are often so focused on the intensity of their connection to their loved one that other areas of life begin to suffer. So intense is that love. You know, like you, 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 you don't eat, uh, you're late for work, you don't look after yourself, you forget to groom, <laughs> you know, and so just for so focused that it does you harm rather than good. And then because it's emotional and it can be mentally draining, you can imagine the worst things that are bad dreams, all right? So something had happened, she perhaps got into this, well, not that perhaps she got into this situation, and so this, this is the experience shared for us that there is such a thing known as love sickness and things can happen to you. Verse 9, the daughters of Jerusalem then said this to her, what is your beloved more than any other beloved or fairest among women? What is your beloved more than another beloved that you so charge us? These are her dear friends, right? This is the cheer team. What's so special about your beloved that you want us to go and tell him you are lovesick and you cannot communicate this on your own? Some, some, what, what's, what's the big deal? And then the Shulamite describes her beloved. Okay, girls, this is your turn, right? Now, before I read, I mentioned before, especially those who are dating and are wives, of course, you're already married. You must know your man well, more than looks, more than his work, his like, his dislike, his weaknesses, who is he with. You, you have to know him well not just the, 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 the surface, his nature, his character, right? You, you don't go and marry somebody uh, because he drives a flashy car, but that would be a serious mistake. You have to know him. And I mentioned last week, I think, it is good to have some friends along and say, hey, what do you think? 
I would say, yeah, he, he, he's, he, he's good for you, or uh, I don't think so, did you know about this, 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 you know what I mean? So you need echoes that, <laughs> that help you along the way. But anyhow, this, this is how the Shulamite describes her beloved, because the daughter of Jerusalem asked, right, what's so special about this guy? My beloved is white and ruddy, chief among 10,000. Wow. She has a very high estimate of him, right? And this is not guesswork. She knows. White and ruddy reminds you of David, right? <laughs> the shepherd boy. His head is like the finest gold. There's kingship in him. His locks are wavy, as black as a raven. His eyes are like doves by the rivers of waters, washed with milk and fitly set. Wow. His cheeks are like a bed of spices, banks of scented herbs. Her lips are lilies, dripping liquid myrrh. His hands are rods of gold set with beryl. His body is carved ivory, inlaid with sapphires. His legs are pillars of marble set on bases of fine gold. His countenance is like Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet. Yes, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. If you want to know why I'm lovesick, this is my man. Hallelujah. And may those who are single, may you find your man matching this description. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Royalty. Strong. Amen. It's more than physical attraction. There is this, he towers, he's, he's a chief among 10,000. There's leadership in him and so on. Hallelujah. I think, I think I'll... I'll I'll close there because of time. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Our response to Jesus will be the same. He is altogether lovely. He is my beloved. And he is my friend. Amen. Jesus is altogether lovely. He is our beloved. And he is our friend. Hallelujah. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for this word for us. We thank you that it can teach us in different levels, teach us about love and romance, brings in purity and chastity within it, and also express to us the love between Christ and the church. I pray for those who are not yet believers in Jesus Christ, if you're watching this online, on YouTube, that you open your heart to the lover of your soul, Jesus Christ, who loves you so much, he gave his life for you. Believe in him for the forgiveness of sins and receive his life into your life. Hallelujah. And so that the day comes where he is, you'll be there with him also for all eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah, amen. Shall we stand, church? Can we all stand? As we close today's service, we want to be encouraged to remember God's promises about us. How He sees us. Because we want to, to always think, we want to always live, according to what he says about us amen not about what the world thinks or says about us right we thank you lord for your faithfulness oh father god
grace. You are the church that Jesus loves. There are many churches, and Jesus loves all churches who believe in Him. But you are the church that He loves. You are the person that He loves. You are the saint that He loves. You are the apple of His eye. You are most beautiful, spotless, blameless, holy, in love. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is with you and will remain with you forever. Till He comes. Amen. God bless you all.